In the second section of the lecture on terrain modeling, we will talk about digital terrain representations. So we will talk about point clouds, thin, regular grid, contours or isolines, and we will mention meshes. So what are point clouds? Point clouds are sets of three-dimensional points given by their XYZ coordinates, and usually the point clouds have some additional information about the individual points, and that may be the return number, R, and also intensity. So we get the position of the point in the three-dimensional space, the return number, its intensity, and also color may be provided. These data are usually provided either in ASCII format, as XYZ coordinates and whatever other values are provided, or in a binary LAS format. And LAS format usually uh, is much richer, provides much more information about the record, about the scan uh, direction, about the edge of flight line, classification of these points and this format is industry LiDAR data exchange format. Extensive processing is done on point clouds and uh, the first thing to do is filtering outliers. This is usually done by the mapping uh, company and uh, like the very oldest raw data used to have these outliers that were very very high uh, in the air such as birds However, the newer data have already these outliers filtered out. Then another type of processing that is done is bare earth point extraction. Because we have multiple return data, they, uh, so the data can be reflected from the vegetation, from the buildings. So bare earth uh, extraction is one of the important um, processing tasks. Then another one is canopy extraction so that we can evaluate, for example, the amount of biomass and also all kinds of structures as extra extraction as well as power lines. Public data sources for, uh, for point clouds, for uh, either raw point clouds or pre-processed point clouds are several. One of them is USGS Click website where you can find raw point clouds. Then another useful website is LDART and that's a website that uh, has coastal point clouds and it allows to do some on-fly processing such as binning, converting to raster and it has also the longest time series of uh, LiDAR data. And then some process data are available from NC flat plane mapping website where we have bare earth points that are already extracted from multiple return data and they also provide uh, gridded 20 foot and 50 foot digital elevation models. So how the point cloud data look like? And we have all already looked at this image so you can see that there are points that are on bare ground, but also that are above ground, either reflecting from vegetation or reflecting from buildings, such as, for example, this is uh, above ground on building. And in this image, the, po the yellow points are first returns and the dark brown points are second and third returns. And this is how these returns uh, uh, are created. Uh, here is the source of laser beam and when this laser beam hits some object it provides a return. So this can be first return, second return, third return, fourth return. And the standard now uh, with the current technologies is for return, uh, for return data. And of course if you are already on bare ground there will be just one return. The point clouds representation is pretty much the directly measured data, but we can do lots of analysis uh, 
on the point clouds themselves. So they are a pretty good representation of topography. Now, tin requires a little bit more processing. Tin is shortcut for triangular irregular network. And this network is constructed from the measured points by triangulation. And it is good to remind that before computer age, these triangles were used for manual interpolation of contours from surveyed points. Now, the, for automated uh, computation of tins, Delaunay triangulation is used. And this approach maximizes the smallest angle of the triangles to avoid skinny triangles that cause all kinds of problems when deriving contours. And we will talk about Delaunay triangulation in greater detail when we will be describing uh, various interpolation methods. One important uh, addition to the standard Delaunay triangulation is so-called constraint Delaunay triangulation that includes predefined edges that cannot be flipped. Good to keep in mind that when working with things, we need to have break lines and predefined edges to constrain the Delaunay triangulation to avoid artifacts. And because we are using XYZ points, TIN is a vector data model representation. And the TIN is built from the original data points, which is sometimes advantage, sometimes it isn't. So for example, here, are the, here is given set of points, and this is just the random sampling of topography and the Delaunay triangulation, which is done usually in just a two-dimensional plane, will look like this. And when you add the z-coordinate, you will get a digital elevation model represented by irregular triangular network. So what are the properties of TIN? As I already said, it requires predefined break lines for man-made features, such as roads, bridges, then also for valleys to avoid artifacts and for faults. Then density of tin is adjusted to surface complexity. This is an important features, uh, feature of tin because you can represent at the same time very small features by very small triangles and large features with large triangles uh, so you don't need so many, so many points. So the, the number of points is really optimized to the complexity of surface. So when is TIN used? It is used mostly in engineering applications where you have lots of uh, man-made structures. Also, it is used a lot when you plan to do manual modification of a model. For example, for various design tasks. Another important application is when you have complex faults for which you know a precise location of these faults, uh, then TIN is a very good choice. And also TINs are used for multi-scale representation for visualization. That means that you have small triangles in those uh, areas that are close to the viewer and uh, uh, large triangles in those areas that are farther from the viewer. So here is a little bit of an example of TIN based digital elevation model. So you can, you can see, although the triangles are very small, you can still see them. And you will see when we will be doing topographic analysis, the slopes in TIN are essentially assigned to triangles. So you will get, instead of the naturally looking slope distribution, you will have a triangle-based slope distribution, which for many applications is really, really artificial. And then another issue is that dams are often created across valleys if you don't have break lines. That's why I stress the importance of break lines because uh, the the triangle edge may be created, for example, like in this case, 
across the valley creating an artificial dam. And then if inputs 14 are points or on contours on the top of the hills or ridges, if you don't have peaks defined, you will get flats. And these flats cause problems, for example, for flow routing. So now let's look at regular grid or raster. We can now tell that raster has become the most common digital elevation model and it's widely used for distribution of digital elevation data. Uh, there are two interpretations to um, raster DEMs. One is that the elevation is assigned to a grid point or center of the grid cell and that's what we will use in our work. But you can also treat digital elevation uh, raster as, uh, as an image and apply image processing techniques and then you work with elevation as assigned to the pixel area. Now the regular grid is usually derived from measured points by gridding. So that means that the points are derived and it can be derived two ways. One is just by binning if we have at least one point for each grid cell. And then we will just assign the elevation of this point to the center of the grid cell or we can compute mean value of all the points in the grid cell and assign it to the center of the grid cell. But if some grid cells do not include any points, then we need to apply spatial interpolation or approximation if the data are noisy and we need to smooth them out. So this is how it looks like. Here we have the same set of given points and the uh, raster representation will have the elevation assigned to these blue grid points. That means that the values of elevations need to be computed. And as I said, it's usually spatial interpolation. If, the, if there are more than one or at least one point per grid cell, you can just assign the value. So what are the properties of uh, raster DEMs? Uh, first and above all, it is a very simple data structure. So it is easy to work with and also to develop uh, algorithms for this data structure. It is also easy to combine this data with imagery. And, uh, uh, but one has to keep in mind that we have uniform resolution and that means that in those areas where we have uh, lower or less complex topography, we may be oversampling and we may not be able capture, to capture at certain resolution the very high detail. So those are the disadvantages uh, of uniform resolution. It used to be a huge problem, but now we can compute uh, the DEMs at very high resolutions, so we are doing a lot of oversampling, but because the data structure is so simple and so easy to work with, it doesn't really matter anymore. Then, representation of faults and sharp break lines, it's not explicit, like in TIN, and it requires very high resolution. And that's the reason why uh, uh, we are striving to get the higher and higher density of LiDAR data in spite of the fact that for many applications what we have already is, is dense enough. But it is really capturing these faults, break lines, structures where we need the uh, very high density. Most available elevation data are distributed as raster data or regular grids and there are many sources, and at the end uh, of, the, of this lecture, there is a link to the website where I have the links to all of the sources of raster digital elevation models. So one of the major resources is USGS Seamless Data Distribution Center. That includes national elevation data set at uh, 
3 meter, 10 meter and 30 meter resolution and it's in geographic coordinates so it would be one arc second, one third of arc second. Then another important source is SRTM data that is provided at 30 meters for United States and at 90 meter resolution uh, for the world and uh, there have been already four releases so the latest one is SRTM v4. Then another important source of DEM is so-called global DEM, GDEM at 15 to 30 meter resolution. This is a global digital elevation model that is derived from Aster satellite stereo bands, so it's from optical data, and it provides relative height. Then for North Carolina, a very special source of digital elevation data is NC flood mapping website that provides, besides the point clouds that I already mentioned, also 20 foot and 50 foot digital elevation models where the 50 foot digital elevation models have carved uh, channels into it. And then for, uh, for source of data that includes the bathymetry is coastal relief model that includes the topography for coastal areas and bathymetry uh, at 90 meter resolution. And then for North Carolina, we also have seamless topography at much higher resolution, at 10 meter resolution, that combines the LiDAR based digital elevation model and the best bathymetry data available along the North Carolina coast. So, in the last uh, uh, digital representation of uh, topography that we will talk about are isolines or elevation contours. It has been traditional approach for representation of elevation. We used to draw them by hand from measured mass points by interpolating along triangle edges. Now the process is fully automated. Sometimes you need to do some manual modifications, but generally it's, gen it's uh, computed from either tin or grid. The issue why we are seeing less and less of isolines is that for these modern uh, elevation data uh, that are very highly detailed, often quite noisy, the, the contours are not very suitable. But uh, isolines are still very useful when the surface has simple geometry. So it is extensively used, for example, in engineering applications. So here is just an illustration how to deal with contours that are generated from LiDAR. So you can see that if you just use a very simple processing of LiDAR data without any smoothing, the, uh, the contours will be very noisy and they include lots of these teeny little hills and holes, small features that, makes the, that make the map uh, uh, rather hard to read but there are techniques how to make these contours smoother so either you compute a smoother digital elevation model uh, and that's the case here and you can see that it really cleans it up quite a bit or sometimes it's done by post-processing. In the next section we will talk about point cloud analysis and how to create digital elevation models by binning.